Thanks. Thank you for that reminder. I already submitted my choices for this evening. So there you go. Cool. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah, if they line up, Stephanie. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. I'm ready for anything. So good. Mm, if anybody has uh has their uh, mic on, if you would just go ahead and uh, mute that. And we've got a got about uh, we got a few more people that are coming in right now, and uh, we've still got well, almost everybody has everybody's done a poll here but it looks like our top three are going to be pre-workout energy drinks of course creatine right everybody wants to know about that it looks like omega threes it's kind of rounded it out here so cool those are going to be our top ones you got those stephanie i predicted that so you did, you did. all right well, getting a little higher here so you can take that into your fantasy league and uh, so Cool. All right. So those are our, our top three there that we're going to be talking about. Well, it's a toss up between vitamin D. If we got time, we, we might hit that. So, all right, Stephanie, I'm going to give you the, the mic here, make you a host. And the floor is yours. All right. Let me get my lovely presentation up there. Awesome. All right. I'm one. I'm psyched. I love to talk about nutrition um, in general. So, you know, trying to make this to the point, get you guys the information that you're here for. Um, so with that, let's just, let's just go ahead and get started. Right. Um, let's not mess around. Um, so before we begin, right. Um, when we're talking about supplements, I think I would be doing you guys a disservice today if I did not talk about third party certification and why that matters. So, because part of what we do when you, we evaluate supplements is we want to make sure that they're safe for us to take, all right? And third parties provide uh, specific certifications that indicate that that supplement is safe for, safe for us to take, um, not just as day-to-day -day people, but especially as athletes. All right, so why does third-party certification matter? All right, so see, I just admitted someone there. So third-party certification um, is provided by an independent organization that verifies uh, that a supplement is free from banned and illegal substances, all right? For me, that is the most important reason um, to look for third-party certification, right? We know that those substances can cause serious health concerns and complications. And especially when we're at the professional level, you know, if you pop positive, there is a consequence and that's usually suspension, right? You're going to miss playing time, which miss time is miss opportunity. Um, and that could be the difference before between you hanging out in the minor leagues or making it to the big leagues as well. Um, and of course it does stay with you. So again, making sure that they're free of banned and illegal substances. Um, secondly, that the company is transparent, right? Even as someone who's honest, who's going to be upfront with what they're providing us. And so how I look at that is what's on that label is in that product and what's in that product is on that label, all right? Um, they, a group looked at herbal supplements that we can find at stores like Walmart and Target. And they looked to see, okay, what's on that label and what's actually in this product. And they found that 80%, 80% didn't contain any of the herbs that were listed on the label. So absolutely no transparency there. All right, and then lastly, um, we wanna make sure that the company that are making these supplements on these products are following good manufacturing practices. And I don't wanna just kind of gloss over that lightly. We're gonna circle back to that because I really had my eyes opened um, when I worked in clinical research and had an opportunity to help formulate some supplements as well. So just how important that is in, in addition to what I've mentioned before. So reputable organizations that we recognize and direct our athletes and we're directing you guys on this call today um, is to look for you know these logos and these companies such as informed choice nsf certified for sport and the banned substance Con control group i guide all my athletes and i guide you guys as well to look for these logos um, on the supplements that you are interested in taking all right you want to be able to um, see these logos pretty visible on those products. 
Um, I think the best first step you could take though is actually go to the websites of these organizations. They're, they have an entire database of all their certified products right there. This is just a really great filter to ensure that one, all the supplements you're looking at are meeting those qualifications, right? That they're free of banned substances, any legal substances, as well as ensuring that that company is being transparent. So what's on that label is actually in that product. Um, and then lastly, they're following those good manufacturing practices. All right. So what do good manufacturing practices look like? And honestly, this was the most eye-opening piece, as I mentioned. So before I came on with the Rangers, I worked for a clinical research group and they, we had a group come to us and said, we want to make a product line. So my job was to pick the ingredients that I, that the research said was most effective. And then I looked to find where we could source them. And what I found is that a lot of the ingredients that go into these supplements are from outside of the United States, right? They come for other countries. So why would that make a difference? Well, it's, are they being held to the same standard when it comes to manufacturers and products made here in the U.S.? And what we know is our ability to inspect and monitor those manufacturers and those uh, facilities is pretty limited, right? The resources that the FDA has here in the U.S., it's even difficult to do that for the companies that are here in the United States. So what these third-party uh, verification programs are, right, that certification insure, ensures that those ingredients from the start all the way through that entire chain to that final product, that they are following good manufacturing practices. And what, and what are those? Right. So one is just making sure that we're keeping up with the conditions of the equipment and making sure that our facilities are clean and sanitized. All right. So this is an example. This is actually a photo of a supplement company um, that definitely doesn't have good manufacturing practices. Um, we can see that that equipment has not been cleaned in a really long time. Um, so making sure that these facilities hold a high standard for cleanliness, for sanitation, and that they're keeping up with the maintenance of their equipment. Secondly, when we don't maintain and we don't have a clean and sanitized environment where these products are made, things can sneak in there, right? Not only banned and illegal substances could potentially contaminate those products, but chemical as well as physical, all right? So physical contamination I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that I'm not looking to can take metal, plastic, wood, glass, or string. Um, pretty sure that's going to tear up your stomach and your intestines as it makes it way makes its way through your body. All right. So good manufacturing practices ensure that it is free from physical contamination and pests. All right. So if we're not keeping things clean and sanitized and we're not making sure that we're preventing contamination of these project or products, pests can sneak in there. Um, those those that lovely powder that's drying out there in the open on these lovely sheets, those little black dots are not a part of it. Um, those are actual pests or insects. So again, these good manufacturing practices really ensure that um, we're not where we're, these products are made in really safe and clean environments. We're not seeing contamination from a chemical, physical, and animal aspect, as well as ensuring that they're free from banned and illegal substances. All right, so when, again, a very, I would say, you know, not the most exciting thing we're gonna talk about today, but honestly, one of the most important things that you guys can remember from this talk is to look for that third party logo, ensuring that that supplement is safe for you to take. I cannot tell you how many questions I get from guys on a daily basis asking me, is this safe to take? Is this all right if I take it? Or just the fear and the anxiety when guys call me and they're like, Steph, I took this like, like bass gainer and I don't know if it's safe or not. Like, is it good? Or usually it's some like ridiculous pre-workout to be very honest. Um, so making sure that you're doing your due diligence at the start, um, so you're not having to fear, like have that fear and anxiety that you possibly have taken something you shouldn't have. All right, now the good stuff, okay? Um, so let's just kick this off with creatine, let's go big. Um, honestly, I could talk about creatine for over an hour, um, but for all, we'll keep it short today. 
Um, so creatine, specifically creatine monohydrate, um, is one of the most well-researched supplements, um, as well as it has very strong evidence to support taking creatine for, uh, uh, there's really strong evidence supporting taking creatine for performance. Um, and what we're also seeing is that there's more and more research suggesting that creatine is beneficial for brain health. So a lot of really good positive things in those first two statements, right? Um, however, there are still a lot of myths and misconceptions that are out there around creatine and especially around is creatine safe for me to take? And they are just that, right? It's myths and misconceptions. The one that I most often hear is that creatine causes dehydration and um, it can cause muscle cramping. And what we know from the research is that that is just not the case. Um, really creatine can help with hydration. Um, and then there was some research that looked at those that took creatine versus that, that weren't taking creatine. And there was absolutely no difference when it came to muscle cramping and tightness as well as heat illness. So what we know is that creatine is safe for our young athletes and our adult athletes, um, and that it can support performance and brain health. Right? Um, however, there are two things that have to happen before we seriously consider adding creatine into our routine. And this is not just for our young athletes, but this is for all the athletes I work with. And that's that we, one, are following an effective training program. Taking creatine doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get stronger, right? You need to get in the weight room. You need to put in the work on the field um, and, and with the weights. And then secondly, you need to have a solid foundation when it comes to nutrition, all right? If you're not putting the things that you need in your body to support growth, development, and the training, right, the demands of your training, you're not going to see the benefits of creatine because creatine is just that, right? It's a supplement. It's there to supplement a good training program and a good diet, all right? So say we check both of those boxes, all right? So how does creatine improve performance and provide benefits for our brain? All right, so first, um, creatine is stored in your muscle, all right? It's stored in your muscle as phosphocreatine, and we use it as an immediate energy source for quick explosive movements, okay? All right, so we can see down here, that the large majority or the majority of the energy contributed. So that nice blue line we see where it's peaking up at almost 100%. This is, this is the phosphocreatine system, right? So that phosphocreatine in our muscle is what is used um, to create energy. This is the system that we use to create, used to get energy from phosphocreatine, right? And we use that during really high intensity efforts, right? That lasts less than 30 seconds. Um, we see this system is really relied upon in our strength and power sports like football, baseball, softball, and sprinting. So keep in mind, I know there's some athletes here who aren't, you know, in your traditional strength and power sports. Um, and sprinting often happens in those types of sports, right, where you have to kind of turn those burners on or, you know, change direction very quickly. So keep in mind that, that, that side of it, and we'll get to that here in a second. Right. So when we take creatine, we actually build up this energy system in our muscles. All right. So we can actually increase the muscle creatine content by up to 15 to 40 percent with supplementing with creatine. So that means we have more gas in the tank to do and perform those quick explosive movements. All right. So what does that look like on the performance side? How does this physiological change affect performance um, in the weight room and on the field or court? All right, so what we see when we have a, a, an effective training program and we have a solid nutrition base, um, you get stronger, right? We see improvements in strength. You can put on more muscle mass um, and you can get faster, all right? So how do those translate onto the field? So for our strength and power athletes, as we mentioned, you're using that energy system a lot. Um, you've got more gas in the tank, meaning that you can now sustain those explos that explosiveness deeper into games. And one of my favorite examples is, is to use, especially since I work in baseball, I also played softball in college. So um, kind of applies there as well for our softball players, obviously, but for pitchers, right? 
you are trying to repeat that explosive mini, uh, movement inning to inning. You want to maintain that same explosiveness from the first inning to the seventh, eighth, ninth, right? Um, for our stop and go sports like basketball, soccer, and lacrosse, um, as well as some of our endurance sports like long distance running, there's often sprints embedded within, right? So you may not always be full out, full go the whole time, right? But you may have to change direction very quickly or make a really good maneuver to advance your position in that race. Or maybe it's a, a, a quick breakaway during a game or, you know, my greatest uh, kind of the visual that I see, especially for our endurance athletes is when everyone's kind of, they're getting closer to the finish line. We're all kind of moving together at the same pace. And then there's just that one athlete that just absolutely breaks away and just widens that gap, right? They just turn those burners on and it can really be the difference between first and second place. Um, this, is, this, this is where creatine can come into play for those athletes, right? It can improve those sprints during and at the end of games and races, all right? So creatine is really can be used for all athletes, right? Not just strength and power. All right, so we mentioned brain health. And honestly, I think for, for all the benefits that creatine can provide, for me, this is the most important one. Um, it's just how are we keeping ourselves healthy and safe? Um, so creatine helps protect uh, the structure and function of the brain. All right, and one study, um, they looked at kids and teens between the ages of one and 18 years old. Um, they gave one group creatine and followed how they, how they did over a six month period. And, and what they found um, is that those that were taking creatine um, after they experienced a concussion spent less time in the hospital. Um, and they saw greater improvements in communication and brain function as well compared to those that were not given creatine. There's also evidence to suggest that taking creatine before can provide protection and decrease the damage after a concussion occurs, all right? So for me, this is a really important reason um, to add creatine into your routine. Obviously, if you've got a good training program and a solid foundation when it comes to nutrition. All right, so now we know why and how. So how do we actually add it into our routine, right? What's the application of it? I think this is the important takeaway here. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can take creatine. Um, there's a loading protocol, and then there's what's called a low dose. And what I have found for most athletes, because if you want creatine to be effective, you have to take it every single day. All right. Um, there's really no benefit to cycling on and off, so you can take it year round. But that low dose is anywhere between three to five grams per day. Um, and I often get asked, when's the best time to take creatine? And honestly, anytime. That's the most important part is that you take it every day. Um, however, if we really want to maximize it and we want to make sure that our muscle is absorbing as much as we possibly can, the best time to take it is in that post-training window and we want to make sure that we pair it with carbohydrate. So I've got our little formula here, got your shaker bottle with your water and milk, and then you pair it with your recovery solution. So you've got your carb and your protein, and then we've got our, our creatine here. All right. So as we go through this, I know that some of you may, may have questions. Um, feel free to drop those in the chat box and we will hopefully have some time to circle back and provide you any answers. Trust me, I love a good Q&A. Good &A. Um, so just make sure to, to drop those questions in there and we'll circle back and get to as many as we can. All right, so next on our list that we're gonna knock out here is pre-workout. And I figured this would be the most popular. Um, because honestly, it, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've had to like kind of hide this from our guys, especially when it's like a yoga day. And I'm like, you don't need it for yoga. Okay. Um, so pre-workout and energy drinks, definitely a very popular topic. Um, and definitely one I think is very important for us um, to, to discuss today. Um, so when, it, when we evaluate this category, right? Um, the number one ingredient that we look for is caffeine, right? Because the effects of caffeine are what athletes are most often looking for when wanting to take a pre-workout or drink energy drinks. And that's really just to feel awake oftentimes um, or to have more energy, okay? Um, but when it comes to caffeine, there are upper limits on the amount that we can take safely. 
Um, so for ages 13 to 18, that limit is 100 milligrams. And for those that are 12 years and under, right, caffeine is just absolutely not recommended, okay? Um, and that's because the side effects often outweigh the benefits here. Um, so when, when we go over this limit, you know, side effects can include elevated heart rate and breathing rate, as well as increased anxiety. It can disrupt your sleep. It can cause you to be jittery. And then, of course, it can come with a lot of GI problems. No one likes to have to run to the bathroom mm -hmm. unannounced or unprepared. Um, so when it comes to my recommendation um, for, for pre-workouts and energy drinks, knowing that there's limits in the amount of caffeine in these products. Um, so when we look at pre-workouts, right, they typically contain anywhere between 130 and 150 milligrams of caffeine per serving. And then uh, energy drinks can contain over 200 milligrams of caffeine in one can. So like way, way, way over that upper limit for many of you who are on this call tonight. All right. So knowing that your limit is 100 milligrams, absolute max, for some of you, absolutely not. So we already know the answer there. Um, but knowing these limits and the amount that are in these products, um, I do not recommend pre-workout or energy drinks for athletes 18 years or younger, all right? Just the risk just outweighs the, the benefit. And we have clear upper limits that have been established because obviously there have been safety concerns. So what I ask you to do instead is focus on these three things. Here are three things you can do right now to feel like you have more energy or be able to really get a good quality workout session or training session um, and practice, all right? And one is focusing on a sound diet, right? We wanna make sure we're getting enough energy, we got enough calories, as well as carbohydrates, and that we're getting a variety of foods in our diets, in our diet. Um, the second piece, which I think honestly is the most important one here, is that we wanna get enough sleep and good quality sleep. Um, this is where I think when you don't feel as awake, where you can definitely do better. So make sure that your sleep, you're getting enough um, and you're getting good quality sleep. And then lastly, often the one that I think it's overlooked is, is what are you doing in those hours right before um, your training session or practice? And oftentimes just adding in a pre-workout meal or snack that's rich in carbohydrates. Um, the fan favorite right now, we have instructional week going on. It's those Nature's Bakery Big Bars. That's a big, we've got some big fans there. Um, had to hold a couple guys back because they were like siphoning off my, my stores. But just making sure that you're getting, um, you know, a carbohydrate rich pre-workout meal or snack before your training session or practice. All right. So again, I don't recommend pre-workout or energy drinks for you guys. However, I do know that some of you do drink them. And I know that in recent, and recently there's been one that's been pretty popular among a lot of the guys that we're seeing um, who are, who are just arriving into our organization, right? So they're coming out of high school and it's bang energy drink. Um, so knowing these upper limits, we want to make sure, right? The first thing we're looking at is caffeine content. So in a one bang energy drink in one can, there's 350 milligrams of caffeine. All right. That's over three times the, the upper limit amount for kids, for you guys, 13 to 18 years old. All right. Um, so big red flag there, right? I mean, it should already be like a solid no. Um, but then we look a little further. Uh, so Bang has super, super creatine. They're actually getting sued over this, just FYI, um, because they say it's, it, it's better absorbed when in fact it, it's, it's showing that it's not. Um, and then they can contain branch chain amino acids. All right. So when I see these two ingredients, in my mind, this needs, these are supplements. This needs to be third party verified. There needs to be a certification on this product. There is no third party certification for Bang Energy drinks. All right. Secondly, when we look at these supplements, they don't even tell you how much is in there. And we know from creatine, obviously this is a different form. It's not creatine monohydrate, but we know we need to get three to five grams for it to be effective for it to work for us. So if we don't know how much is in there, one, do we know if it's actually going to help? And it just really shows that this company is not being transparent. 
And then lastly, I did some digging into who started Thang and what's their history, because I do think that's really important when we look at supplements. And the parent company of Bang, VPX, has been associated with products that contain banned substances. All right, so for me, those are some really glaring red flags and honestly is super shady, all right? So again, we definitely avoid our, and we don't want to include pre-workouts and energy drinks, but definitely be wary of products like this that are on the market. Cause trust me, I am a sucker for marketing. If it looks amazing, I am like tempted to buy it. All right. So I know there's lots of colors and flavors, but just again, I, be aware of that a lot of things are hidden, even though it looks great, it's actually not that great for you. All right. And on to our last supplement, our omega-3s. Um, I've talked a lot about these recently, so hopefully I do it justice one more time. So we often use the term omegas and fish oils interchangeably. Um, so we're going to start with kind of the bigger piece there, which is the omegas. Um, so omega-3s are a type of fatty acid. Um, um, they're one of the fats that we consider healthy. It's also essential, meaning that our body cannot make omega-3s on its own. So we have to consume them through the food we eat, all right? So the two types of omega-3 that are often associated with performance and brain health are EPA and DHA, all right? And these are found primarily in oily and fatty fish, all right, such as salmon, tuna, um, sardines, I don't know if that's your jam. I know some guys love those. Um, it just cracks me up when I see it and they're like eating it freestyle on a cracker. And I'm like, good for you, bro. Good for you. Um, but salmon seems to be the most popular one. Um, and, uh, the, the recommendation for pretty much everyone is try to get at least three to four of these types of oily or fatty fish in per week. Right. And I know for some of you that might be really tough and that might be a challenge and that's okay, right? Um, as long as you're making an attempt, maybe it's once or twice a week, um, you know, supplementation can be useful. So when we look for supplements, we want to definitely look for that third party certification, but we also want to make sure that we're getting the right dose and that's between two to three grams per day. All right. And that two to three grams should consist of those two fatty acids, EPA and DHA. All right, so how do, or how does EPA and DHA impact performance? So EPA is associated with recovery, right? It plays a pretty awesome role in inflammation, which we're gonna go over here in a second. Um, and then EPA is most often associated with brain health. And there's really like some really cool research that came out of TCU looking at how DHA can help um, protect your brain and help you recover as well before and after a concussion. All right, so let's jump into the EPA side and talk about how omega-3s can impact recovery. All right, so inflammation, which is a pretty complex process in the body, and I think we use this term a lot when we talk about nutrition. Um, so I'm going to kind of break this down in a, in, a, in a pretty easy way to understand here. Um, so inflammation is a normal and important part of your immune system's response, right? Especially to injury and infection. It helps your body heal and, and fight off those foreign invaders, right? Um, but it's also important for exercise adaptation. So we know that a little bit of inflammation is important, right? It helps keep us healthy and it can help us improve um, when it comes from a performance standpoint. All right. So we kind of think of inflammation as this flame, right? It's kind of burning we want to keep it, we want to keep it in control, right? However, if that flame gets too big, it can cause a lot of damage in our bodies and it can stop you from getting better, right? All right. You'll start to break down more. Um, you'll probably start to play worse. We've seen it guys who have poor diets. I mean, it, it, it will catch up to you guys and gals who have poor diets. It might catch up to you. Um, and then you are generally more likely to get injured and sick. All right. So we want to keep that flame at a normal level, right? Ready to fight infection when needed, but we don't want it to let, we don't want to let it get out of control. Diet plays a pretty big role in keeping that inflammation or that flame in check. Okay. So we see on our left, 
We've got some foods like sodas and fast food, fried foods, processed foods like chips and candy and alcohol as well, all right? Eating foods like this is like throwing gasoline on that flame, all right? It can get out of control and cause a lot of damage if a large amount of the foods that we're putting in our body are these types of foods, okay? So I'm not saying you have to stop eating this because trust me, I love a good donut every now and then. Um, but we want to eat less of these, okay? We don't want to eat these as often. And we want to eat more foods that are on the right, right? That keep that flame in check, like our omega-3s, so that EPA, and other healthy fats that we can find in nuts, seeds, and avocados, fiber in our whole grains and our whole grain products, and then, of course, our fruits and vegetables, right? These are like your team of firefighters. Um, they go in and they put out that flame when it gets too large and it stops it from getting out of control. All right, so DHA, right? We mentioned that it plays a pretty big role in brain health. Um, so DHA is the main fatty acid found in your brain, right? And it can be used just like creatine when it comes to concussions, right? So it provides protection um, and it can help heal and recover um, that brain after concussion. We've also found that um, it can decrease that damage and set up for faster healing and recovery after you experience a concussion. So pretty, pretty awesome research here. Um, it's been cool to see that evolve. There's also some, some research saying that DHA can prevent or slow the dec decline of brain function as we age. Um, and they've actually looked at patients who have Alzheimer's and they found that they have lower DHA levels in their brain. Um, so knowing this and knowing how this can impact, you know, the, the inflammation and your ability to recover as well as your brain health, you know, for all of us on this call, parents, students, student athletes, myself, um, making sure that we're getting, you know, we're aiming for three to four uh, servings of oily or fatty fish per week, or we're including a EPA and DHA supplement, I think is just really beneficial um, for our health, as well as for us as athletes, um, for performance. All right. And with that, I am going to open the floor for our discussions. Um, so we had one question with what would swimming be? Um, I think it would, and this is pertains to creatine. Can I get are able to get some clarification there. Is that Catherine on the call? Yes. Oh, in, in reference to creatine. So I think it would really just depend on your event and that duration. So you would want to see, um, you know, how long are you in that pool for? But for most of the events I know, um, unless you're doing like more than I would say 30, 60 minutes, um, you could probably benefit from creatine, especially if it's more of those sprint events. And we also got a question on Horback Omega 369. Um, I'm not familiar uh, with that product, but I can definitely look into it for you if you're looking for more about um, third party certification as well as where they're sourcing their their omegas from and provide you some more insight there. So I'm just going to make a quick note of that for you as well. Um, so does creatine affect kidney function? So that's actually a great question because that is one that often comes up as well when we're talking about creatine and safety. Um, so as athletes, um, and how, so kind of backtrack here, how we identify kidney function, there's a few different ways that we, we evaluate that. And one of that is we look at creatinine clearance. And creatinine is a byproduct of creatine metabolism, so how we break down and use creatine for energy. So in ath athletes, right, you guys are just more active than the general population. So you're normally going to have um, maybe elevated levels of creatinine um, 
and at time usually not without without or not out of that normal range um so we just have to keep in mind that athletes are different than our general population um but when we take that into account that that's kind of a normal occurrence in athletes then we understand that it's not affecting that kidney function in itself right um so as long i always recommend you know our guys continue to stay hydrated. I think that's the most important factor when it comes to hydration or kidney function is just staying hydrated as well. Um, if I can add something to that around the, the, the creatine too, uh, Stephanie, you know, yeah, of course. one of the things too is athletes always ask, when should I take creatine? And I always say to introduce creatine into your, into your diet is probably when you're started on your program where you've had maybe three or maybe even as much as five months under your belt, right? That you've got this level of physical fitness and you've adopted a really good nutritional habit. Where we start seeing problems with creatine, okay, is when you take creatine and you are not in a high level of condition state. That's going to allow you to create forced reps in an unconditioned bodied environment that is where we see cramping there's where we see the strains and the pulls because it allows you to push yourself past where you're at and you want to be at a high level of physical development before you introduce creatine into your your, your program and on top of that if we're introducing creatine on top of deconditioning on top of poor hydration on top of poor or inadequate nutrition calories in our body that is a recipe for rhabdo paralysis that's a recipe for actual happening of you know some a negative effect as a result of the creatine but the creatine is just a byproduct of not being in shape not maintaining hydration and really not maintaining a good nutritional diet that supports what you're doing each and every day so i just i want to make that point because i did see one down here you know, like can i take creatine forever well yeah, if you're always in shape, most certainly, but there's going to be times when you need to take off it because your level of you, you, your body needs a rest. So, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, but I wanted to, I always have to make that one uh, really, uh, that was a big one I always had to make relevant to my kids because as soon as the off season came, well, I got to get better. I got to get stronger. Well, let your body heal a little bit right now. Let's, let's reintroduce a higher volume of work, get your body at the speed, and then we can introduce creatine into your into your system and that'll really help you push past that plateau. Right. And, and we do that with our guys and it's honestly all supplements, you know, unless it's something where, you know, like omega threes, for example, that's something that a lot of our guys, if, if they don't have access to those fatty fish on a, that they can get three to four times a week. Um, we just take a break from it all. And that's usually right at the end of the season as they're transitioning to that off season, just to give, give them, uh, give them a break, but no, yes, Mike, I, I agree. Definitely. So I, I apologize if that wasn't clear. Um, but I know it, it's usually a combination of things. It's not just creatine. It's a combination of things where you're creating an environment in your body where there's just a lot of breakdown and you don't have the ability to handle that. Um, so those, those fitness levels and your ability to handle that volume of training. And if you pair that with bad nutrition, poor hydration, um, yeah, you're going to experience some really negative side effects. Um, okay. Uh, the proper dosage of DHA. So, um, so the recommended amount, uh, for general population for DHA and EPA combined is 500 milligrams. Um, I think that's fairly low, honestly. Um, so I know that I have seen upwards of um, around, usually around, I would say four to 500 milligrams of DHA on its own. And that's what usually you find in a lot of those supplements. Um, so, but I always try to see if there's a combination of EPA and DHA that hits around that two, two gram mark. Um, kind of answered the creatine question there. Uh, is it okay to mix creatine with protein shakes? Also, is it is creatine monohydrate better to take pre or, or post workout? So obviously, if you're checking all those boxes from a training and nutrition perspective, um, creatine is definitely okay to mix into your protein shakes. 
And like I mentioned, I think it is important, you know, if you are taking creatine, just making sure that you're staying consistent with it, if you're wanting to see those benefits. Um, but if you're really interested in the timing piece, we often recommend um, post-training and that's because the, the training stimulus in your body creates an environment in your muscle where it's like ready to refuel, right? Um, and you can really maximize that window by consuming creatine with carbohydrate. So they kind of work synergistically together. So not only are we looking to refuel our muscle faster with carbohydrate, um, creatine can assist with that as well as carbohydrate can assist with making sure creatine gets into that muscle cell. Um, are there other ways of getting omega-3s other than fish and pills? Um, so there, there are some other sources, uh, other types of omega-3s. So I was specifically referring to our EPA and DHA. Um, so it's kind of funny because uh, the result of those fish having the, that omega-3 content is because they eat krill. So it's really the krill in their diet that is making them rich in EPA and DHA. Um, so sometimes you can find krill oil or you can find supplements made from krill, um, but there's other types of omega-3s that they're just not DHA and EPA, but things like flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts. I always think of walnuts are good for your brain with the omega-3s because a walnut looks like your brain. I thought that was always fun. Um, so those are some other sources of omega-3s as well. So would you say taking magnesium and potassium together on a daily would help with recovery and avoid cramps? Um, so cramps is kind of a, you know, muscle cramping. There's a lot of things that could cause it, right? So Mike mentioned just being, um, you know, undertrained essentially, right? Um, and trying to push yourself beyond your limits. Um, it can also be from like a, a neuromuscular standpoint. Um, and then the hydration piece is one, is one potential reason why that we experience muscle cramps. Um, so I think making sure we're getting adequate amounts of magnesium in our diet from food would be the first step. Um, so magnesium is important for muscle function and muscle contractions. Um, we can usually find that in our dark leafy green vegetables and nuts and seeds and in beans. Um, potassium as well, we can get that from, from foods as well. But if we're really looking at the hydration perspective and making sure that we're replenishing our electrolytes, we want to focus on sodium number one and we want to, and then potassium is number two. So in a lot of our rehydration solutions, like our Gatorade or Powerade, drip drop, um, I mean, there's so many out there. Um, it's hard to keep track of those. We want to use those when we need to use them, right? They're sports rehydration solutions for a reason. Um, so we want to time those around training and competition, especially if it's hot and humid or we're outside and sweating for more than 60 to 90 minutes, as well as are you a heavy or a salty sweater? And I think if you can be more strategic and when you're using those, really nail it down on that food first, it potentially should help um, from, with that recovery and that cramping as well. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming in and, and giving us your time. And thank you guys all. Appreciate the, the GACS community giving us your time. Rich, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to put this and host this, uh, this event for you guys. We'd like to be able to do this at least once every quarter. Uh, and so hopefully this isn't the last time. That, uh, that we get to uh, do this for you guys and uh, be available. One thing that uh, what we want to do, again, our mission is as a company is to really deliver nutrition, performance nutrition solutions to everybody. We want to be able to be a part of that mission. And one of the ways you guys can help that is really going out on, on, the, on the web and, and on your social network and saying, hey, at Critical Reload, uh, that would be terrific. Uh, and and what, what that would be is what did tonight offer you guys? How did it offer you guys the most value? What did you get the most out of this evening? Um, that would be a, a big help for us because we're trying to just get the word out because we want to do it the right way. And hopefully you found a tremendous value in, in what we brought here tonight, not only athletes, but parents. Because I know the parents have lots of questions. Sometimes the kids 
we'll, we'll come to them and, and bring them questions. And, and maybe the parent doesn't know and they don't have a place to turn to. Uh, feel free to reach out to Rich. Rich will get in touch with us and we will get the answer to you guys. It's that important. The child's health and safety is, and we want to make sure we're doing that the right way. So um, if uh, any other questions uh, that you guys have, obviously you can direct those to Rich. Uh, we will definitely make sure, uh, Coach Burnett, we get you a copy of this and, and make it available. And again, thank, thank you guys so much for, uh, for this evening. Yeah, thank you, Mike. We're grateful yeah. for you and your partnership. And uh, excited for the future, man. This is awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. That was awesome. Like, seriously, just so good. Um, everybody's asking about bangs, so it's good that you address that. <laughs> Big awesome. no for me over here. So hopefully that, that translates. Yeah, it's clear. <laughs> here it is. If anybody got anything tonight is don't drink bang. <laughs> A huge win in my book right there yeah sure about to, you know tackle a grizzly bear i guess It'll be the only time, but. yeah cool cool man well thank you guys again have a great evening and uh we'll see you next time see you in about three months all righty sounds good take care bye-bye have a good night guys So hopefully it's saved for him when the meeting ends, Stephanie. I'm, I'm hoping. Because now that you're host, oh. I'm sure. I'm guessing oh, do I need to end? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for it. having me. Coach, really appreciate it. That was, hey, Coach, that was what? I said that was great. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. Man. Yeah, of course. Of course. All right. Have a good night, guys. You too. Thanks. <laughs>